Hello, and welcome to the first installment of our four-part series on strategies for recruiting students to the humanities. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Scott Muir, Project Director for Study the Humanities, which with generous support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, supports efforts to attract more undergraduates to the humanities. Today, our focus is on strategies for articulating career pathways for humanities majors. I'm very pleased to be joined by three leaders of successful efforts to draw clearer connections between humanities education and exciting career opportunities. Jolie Proudfit, Professor and Chair of American Indian Studies and Director of the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center at California State University, San Marcos. Lynn Itagaki, Associate Professor of English and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Missouri. And Timothy Melly, Professor of English and American Studies at Director of the Miami and Director of the Miami University Humanities Center. We're proud to have Miami University as an NHA member. We plan to have plenty of time for discussion and questions from the audience today following their three presentations. Please submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll be sharing links through the chat, but please be sure to submit your questions via Q&A rather than the chat so they don't get lost. Before we hear from our presenters, I'd like to take a moment to frame our conversation in light of our research on effective recruitment models, which you can explore through the link just shared in the chat. Since 2018, we have surveyed more than 400 faculty and administrators at over 300 institutions regarding the challenges they face in attracting students to the humanities, the audiences they are engaging to address those challenges, and the strategies that they have found to be effective. In our quantitative data report on our humanities recruitment survey, we highlight a striking consensus that concerns about job prospects are the most influential recruitment challenge across all types of institutions. Respondents also cited related factors, discouragement from parents and other influences, and debt driving students to maximize their immediate return on investment as among the most influential challenges. With hindsight, perspective on the widespread decline in humanities majors and enrollments precipitated by the Great Recession of 2008, it is increasingly clear that effective strategies for articulating career pathways are essential to ensure that future generations of students have access to high quality humanities education. Respondents also observed that this challenge is more perception than reality. As the data featured in the study, the humanities toolkit just linked in the chat demonstrates, humanities majors career outcomes remain strong and futurists predict that demand for humanity skills will increase considerably. So how are faculty and administrators working to confront widespread misconceptions and replace them with a rich picture of the true possibilities? Our new report, Strategies for Recruiting Students to the Humanities, a comprehensive resource, presents the many effective approaches collected through our research. Articulating career pathways is the focus of the entire first chapter. It's also a consistent theme throughout the subsequent chapters of the report curricular innovations, cultivating a marketing mindset, and fostering humanities identity and community. We hope you'll join us for our upcoming webinars on those themes at this hour on June 22nd, July 15th, and July 29th, respectively. See the link just shared in the chat for a list of speakers and to register for each event. Within the chapter on articulating career pathways, we've organized the exemplary initiatives highlighted into five subcategories presenting career placement data and success stories to debunk misconceptions about career prospects, career readiness programming, integrating career preparation and humanities instruction, internship programs, and engaging employers and alumni to facilitate opportunities for students. In a moment, our panelists will illustrate how they've implemented several of these strategies at the department level, through interdisciplinary centers, and at a large college of arts and sciences. There's a wide range of effective approaches to draw from in the report. The trick is figuring out what will work on your campus. As you work to develop a strategy, we also urge you to take advantage of the expertise and resources of your scholarly societies. For example, the American Historical Association, the American Philosophical Association, and the Modern Language Association each support their members through expertise and resources. We'll host an additional webinar in the fall on how you can leverage those resources to attract more undergraduates to the humanities. The available on-campus resources will vary from existing career services to infrastructure for interdisciplinary collaboration to funding priorities set by senior administrators. 
And some of our colleagues are yet to be fully convinced of the need to commit to this work wholeheartedly. This is why it is so important that we take the time to learn from those who have led successful efforts like professors Itagaki, Melly, and Proudfit with us here today. We hope you'll enjoy learning not only what they are doing to replace misconceptions about humanities career prospects, but how they have built their programs, rallied support from their colleagues, and secured and leveraged resources to forward their initiatives in sustainable ways. By learning from one another, we can change the conversation about careers and demonstrate that the humanities offer a reliable, adaptable foundation for career success. I'll now hand it over to Lynn Itagaki of the University of Missouri. Thank you so much, Scott. It is such a pleasure to be with my fellow panelists, Tim and Julie. And then also thank you, B, Cassie, and Scott for um, providing and uh, for providing support. So um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, there's a lot of granular detail that I can't go through um, in my five to 10 minutes, but I will try some of those um, of the more um, you know, foundational uh, details. So basically, I was the faculty fellow for undergraduate career readiness in the College of Arts and Sciences Dean's office uh, for the last two years. So my term just ended this past May. And um, basically, my position began um, with my fellow colleague, another faculty fellow who was in charge of retention. So at one point they wanted to put those two together, retention and career readiness, but clearly with retention efforts, especially through the pandemic, um, that job was quite a faculty fellow position on its own. So they decided to split it off. And basically um, the nuts and bolts of it was that it um, was a course release every year for a faculty. And we have a 40% research, 40% teaching and 20% service. So then my, my split became 40, 30, 30. Um, so one course release every year and the opportunity for a summer stipend, meaning one month of full-time work or spread out over two and a half months as the case may be. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the faculty fellow and the kind of investment that the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences um, put in to uh, undergraduate career readiness. Basically, this was a kind of call from alumni that Dean Oker, my former Dean, had um, had conversations with alumni. And so a variety of initiatives came from this, not just the faculty fellow, but other thing, other projects that I superintended. And it's part of larger kind of trajectories in getting alumni more involved also uh, increased focus for public institutions on development, advancement, or um, fundraising, given the pullback of state and federal um, funding of, of education since really the 1970s. So, you know, the first year that I was working, it was fact finding. So it's kind of um, developing the tools, um, both at the institution, but then also thinking nationally in terms of uh, NACE, so the National Association for Colleges and Employers, which many of you are familiar with in terms of their, um, uh, their career competencies, which they just revised, and um, how one can incorporate it in the classroom. Another reason why a faculty fellow was so important was that um, staff, so our internships coordinator, who is housed in the dean's office and works closely with the Career Center, which is um, a unit that is serving various colleges, um, was finding that there was some pushback from faculty, you know, that did not want to or saw themselves as becoming too uh, professional driven or career oriented when the humanities or the arts and sciences should be focused more on that kind of liberal arts model. So uh, it was important for Dean Oker to think about how um, faculty could be um, influenced or encouraged to think in terms of their curriculum redesign um, and then also uh, changing within or adding, you know, or bringing in alumni for various um, events. So it serves a couple of purposes, not only development's interest in cultivating younger alumni and bringing them in, not necessarily for the, you know, the three T's of development, which is time, talent and treasure, but more so the time and talent and to get them used to kind of coming into um, help out and to connect with uh, undergraduates who were just two or three years away from where they were at that time. So first year's fact finding, it's going to the undergraduate 
um, council going uh, studies council going to the undergraduate um, studies committees in various uh, different departments and units within the college and talking with faculty about what they're already doing for um, professionalized or career skills building within the classes or in alumni um, events. And then um, also like thinking and strategizing which courses might be able to incorporate more um, and think about how they might incorporate it earlier. So one thing that we found is that at the capstone level, senior capstone, or maybe um, in the upper division courses, faculty were thinking about building career skills at that time, maybe including resume or connecting with the uh, uh, webinars that were in the career center. But what we wanted to do was really emphasize first and second year, so the lower division classes, because not only would it um, give students more lead time in this very tough job market, but then also develop their thinking in relationship to internships, what they could be doing as first years. And then most important, when we're kind of bleeding majors from the humanities, but attracting majors in those general education courses that have, you know, four or 500 students like Harry Potter or something along those lines, right? And really reach a broad range of students and show them what kinds of exciting careers they could have, not majoring in something that's immediately relevant to their family members in terms of biology or um, other or communication, for example. Nothing against it. They have really wonderful um, uh, career skills incorporated in the classrooms, which have been helpful to all departments. Um, across campus. So there were a couple of things. Um, one is um, a larger program that um, the dean implemented that I was a part of, was, which was called ANS for Success, which was targeting and looking for alumni who had interesting and provocative life experiences and career um, opportunities and to connect them with students on campus, whether that was through a panel, whether it's through a webinar, um, and really focus on younger alumni. We found that uh, students, uh, current students are really influenced and really um, uh, admire students who are, or, I'm sorry, alumni who are recent graduates because they see themselves in these, um, in these uh, graduates. So while for some, for some, when we initially think about panelists, um, they might think, oh, we're going to have these distinguished alums, you know, in their 50s or 60s who've been out for 20 plus years. But in fact, we wanted recent alumni because of the Great Recession, because of the pandemic economy. More recent alumni have had to deal with these kinds of shifts. That also becomes another um, way to kind of win over faculty is that we have never seen the kind of economic downturns that our students have been facing in the last 10 or 10 to 12 years. And so it really becomes this kind of effort um, to help them since the, the wealth, um, the wealth um, uh, studies have shown that baby boomers, if they make a certain amount in terms of wealth building, uh, Generation X of which I'm a part will have half of that wealth at the same age and then millennials who, um, you know, this generation right now who are graduating are just on the cusp of, will have only a quarter of what baby boomers had for in terms of wealth. So we, it, it really is this, this equity um, issue that is so important to my research, but then also important to giving our students that leg up. And so, you know, that's kind of the, um, the, um, the nuclear option in some ways um, in trying to convince faculty that we really have to incorporate this in ways that we were never trained to do and that we never considered when we were going through grad school programs, when we were doing our teaching um, assistantships. So um, what I would say too, is that, you know, that um, first and even the second year, one of the, the projects that came out of it was actually homegrown on our campus, although there's many different versions of this across the nation, called ANS Professor for a Day. And basically what we were encouraging departments to do was to target a recent alumni, bring them through Zoom, it's so easy to do this past year, bring them through Zoom and, um, and they can visit classes if that's what they have time for. Um, they can talk about their experiences. They can give a later afternoon um, kind of overview of all the ways 
that their degree in the arts and sciences, in the humanities, helped them in their current career, which again is so compelling to current graduates, or sorry, current students who are thinking about graduating and going. And it brings those, um, their time and talent into the networks of these different departments and really builds that kind of alumni base that oftentimes development and advancement are not targeting until 10 years out. So you know that zero to 10 year sweet spot for um, this professor for a day, and it can help the alumni in their career um, maybe their, their um, employer has, um, you know, in-kind donations or ways that they're recognized, but it's a CV builder for a young alumni in this tough job market. So it benefits everyone bringing that time and talent onto campus, possibly creating mentorship opportunities for current students, possibly also um, having maybe even um, creating an internship opportunity. So I'll kind of wrap up there, but I'm happy to talk about different um, permutations, different things that we did. Um, I, you know, I tried to influence um, faculty in various ways. So when the, the teaching, um, when we would have renewal teaching weeks or, you know, we'd have a symposium on teaching, I and, and other, um, you know, converts to uh, career skills building in the classroom would give presentations about how we could um, incorporate things quickly and easily into the classroom on our syllabus, um, extra credit activities, um, and, and things along those lines. But also too, encouraging faculty to just hang out at career fairs. It's amazing just talking with employers, how much they need humanities with the kind of emphasis on ethics, morality, and narrative that only really humans can provide, not algorithms, not computers, but this kind of benchmark, this kind of decision making that really only humans can do. And so places like the Social Security Administration, who knew that they were looking for people who could read narrative really well, and that would open up careers in the humanities, or all these different places, you know, just in talking um, with other federal um, government um, uh, uh, bureaus and, and units, right? They need narrative, they need humans, and they need decision makers who are trained in the humanities. But it's these kinds of um, granular, compelling stories of faculty who are, and administrators who are chatting with employers that really make that kind of convincing um, story possible for future faculty and other faculty to, um, to engage with career skills. So thanks so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Lynn and Tim. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, it's great to be here. I want to thank the National Humanities Alliance for the work you're doing. And thanks to Lynn and, and Jolie too. And um, it's, it, you know, I wish we had a little, I, I need to get a little clip of what you just said, Lynn, about um, narrative, because I think that would, that would be a nice little video to, to, uh, to make the case. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the problem that I felt like we were responding to. Um, when I became the director of the Humanities Center at Miami, um, the recession was, was really, we actually were created during the recession. So what we were, you know, what we were facing is familiar to everybody here. Um, there was this kind of public narrative about the humanities that was very much, um, you know, powerful. It was very much being rearticulated by the parents of our students. They're, they're impractical, they're old fashioned, they're disconnected from reality. They don't lead to good jobs. Um, these ideas were um, were repeated by politicians uh, and other leaders, um, and they affected students. Students, um, you know, a couple of uh, a specific problem that we had at Miami is that students did not go to the career center. Um, they viewed the career center on our campus as an outpost of the business school. And they shared uh, in that view, that, um, that view was shared by faculty. Faculty saw the, the Career Center pretty cynically um, as just working on behalf of our business school students. And we noticed that our students were, were what um, I call humanities fatalists, right? They believed, they loved books and stuff, but they felt like they were gonna, you know, end up in some little Oliver Twist-like situation with those gloves that have the fingers cut off. Um, so what we did about this is, um, as usual, we complained a lot about it. And um, 
When we did that, I started to recognize that there was another problem, which was the defensiveness of faculty. We really believed in what we were teaching. We believed that our work was incredibly valuable, but we didn't have a lot of evidence. Um, so we wanted to start by looking at it, by trying to gather evidence. Now, this was a long time ago. This was eight years ago, but we put together a task force called Valuing the Humanities. There were 10 faculty members in it. And they basically went around and tried to gather uh, much of the information that's now pretty widely available and that the NHA is doing a great job of, of pushing out there. And I'm not going to, um, I'm not gonna repeat uh, all of this stuff. We gave them very concrete outcomes to work on. They were supposed to write little elevator speeches and PowerPoints and portable language that could be used across departments for making the case to parents and students. Um, you know, there's now a wealth of really robust data about humanities career outcomes. The Humanities Indicators um, organization that's part of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences is doing a tremendous job of longitudinal data collection. There are private firms that have done a great job of this, and I'm, I'm not going to get into this, but the, the, the long and short of it is that there's very robust confirmation that humanities and liberal arts majors lead to very, very, very good career success. Um, salaries, job satisfaction outcomes are very similar to those in other majors. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we started. We didn't really arrive at that conclusion in, in 2014 when we began this project. So but we continued to work on gathering that data. And then we began a second phase of our program. And this was a collaboration with our career center that is called Humanities Works. It's now, uh, I guess it's uh, six or so years old, maybe seven years old. And it's, we've had a lot of faculty and administrators participate in this program. I'm gonna tell you about how the program went through a couple of phases really quickly. The, in the first phase, we, we asked each humanities department at our institution to nominate a faculty member from their department. The faculty member received $1,000 in professional expense funds and agreed to meet with um, a group, including two career services officers for about eight times over the course of a year. And they were charged with creating a new advising plan for their department that would then be approved by the department. Every major or prospective major in their department, everyone who walked into the chief departmental advisor's office would get that career plan handed to them. That was the goal. Um, we had a couple other goals. One of the, the chief goal was to make sure that every humanities major at Miami University got evidence-based career guidance for four years. Um, we also wanted to help those students better articulate the value of their education for graduate school and employers. Um, we wanted to make sure that our majors were using the career services office. We had a pretty good set of programs in our career services office, but the office had very much ignored the humanities and had bought into the idea that they weren't, weren't really working on our behalf. So another thing we wanted to do, and this was a less overt goal, but we wanted to change the culture of the career center. We wanted them to identify serving humanities majors as a measurable outcome for their center, something that we could hold them to, like how many people did you see that are humanities majors this year? How does that compare to last year? How does it compare to science majors? How does it compare to business majors? And we also wanted to engage faculty with people who were skeptical about the value of what they were doing. Um, and so the three pr problems here were that this problem of public perception, a problem in our career services office, where the, the office was not oriented towards serving our students, and then a problem in among our faculty who were very defensive and often didn't have the data to back up their, their concerns. Um, we had all these meetings throughout the year. We had very frank discussions about our often very different perceptions of how much students should be addressing careers during their education. Um, there were some fights. Um, you know, we had people say like the point of a college education is to get a job. And we had faculty up in arms about that. And um, so it was very lively, but we built trust. 
um, I think faculty came to see that they were pretty disconnected from the reality of the job market. Um, we learned a lot about career center programs. Um, we collaborated on, on building those career advising guidelines for each department. We learned how to track our alumni and build alumni networks. Um, we talked about best practices in advising, and we even did a field trip to three businesses where we met with business leaders and, um, and alumni. Um, each department built this career advising plan. Um, it's most of them, they were all unique. Everyone insisted that theirs had to be different from the others, which I found slightly annoying, but it, but it worked. Um, and they mostly included um, telling students to take a certain series of programs that our career center offered. We also built some collaborations around alumni programming. We launched a new career, uh, humanities career week and the, the career services office published the career plans for us. Um, so this actually had a pretty big effect. Um, roughly three times as many students after that year started using the Career Center. Um, those are um, for humanities, uh, humanities students. And we've had a lot of students, uh, we've had a lot of faculty um, participate in this program since then. It's, it's since gone through two other iterations. Um, we had a second phase where a smaller group of faculty members worked on creating an advising PowerPoint for their department, some website materials, and a brochure. So we started, we started moving back to the departments and working on public relations activities that, that faculty and um, departments could push to students. Um, so part of the, the goal here was to involve as many faculty as possible in these discussions so that they could then go back and engage in this kind of work. And then finally, um, this program has become organized around building practical sort of assignments into classes. Um, it's now being funded entirely by our Career Center and faculty are being paid $5,000 each to build a large assignment into a class. I've listed some of those assignments here, but in the interest of time, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna wrap up there and um, be happy to ask, answer questions about any of this later. Thanks so much, Tim. Jolie? Miu Yum, Natong, Jolie Proud Fit. Hello, everyone. I'm zooming to you from my home in Carlsbad, California, which is the traditional territory of the Pamp, Wicham, Luceno people, of which I am from. So I'm glad to work and live and play within my ancestral homelands. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who made this um, conversation possible and for including um, American Indian Studies. American Indian Studies is very interdisciplinary. Many of our core courses are um, embedded in the humanities. We cannot preserve our languages without the humanities. We cannot know our, um, we cannot change the narrative of our future without understanding the past. Our religion and philosophy is central to who we are as human beings. Um, it's central to how we're going to um, save the planet. And, and so these, um, this understanding of humanities is a critical uh, way uh, for us to preserve and protect our culture. So I not only chair the American Indian Studies Department, but I run the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center, which is the only center of its kind in the state dedicated to preserving and protecting um, sovereignty. We have 109 federally recognized tribes in California who are amongst the largest employers in the state of California. In San Diego County, one of the largest employers, if not the largest employer of um, East County, San Diego are three tribes who um, with their ancillary businesses and their impact, um, will students will come into some form of engagement with working with tribal communities. Um, I come from a tribal community that is one of the largest employers in Riverside County, a very large county. So for us, career readiness is just pro forma of how we do business. Um, American Indian Studies is heavily focused on community-based participatory research. So we require our students to engage in research that matters, research that makes an impact, um, and they also are engaged in independent studies and in internships 
so that they are prepared to work within the community. The majority of our students are non-native. They come from all kinds of backgrounds. What we do find is that our students are re repeat customers and they are repeat customers because they're taking courses that really matter and that fulfill GE criteria. I have the unique challenge of, of running a department that's um, growing, um, but I also developed the department. And when I developed the department, we started with a couple of courses and now we're up to about 40 courses a year. The department is five years old. Um, what other disciplines in the humanities are growing that fast, right? We find that our colleagues, our programs are shrinking and a lot of investment is moving towards our colleges of business, our STEM programs, and they're separating the humanities from kind of our knowledge base when we're inserting and building those relationships. So to give you an example of some of the courses that we offer so that you can see we're not your, maybe your grandmother's humanities kind of emphasis. These are some of the courses that we offer. So you can kind of get a feel for um, what our students are learning. We offer courses, um, and I'm gonna just give you some titles of what um, we're offering. American Indians, Colonialism and Critical Thinking. Uh, California Indian Art and Artists. American Indian Religion, Philosophy and Worldview. Contemporary Issues in American Indian Art. American Indian Youth Literature, Learning to Tell the Good from the Bad. Applied Indigenous Arts. California Indian Culture and History. American Indian and African American response to colonization through the arts, American Indian digital humanities, American Indian culture and language, US history through indigenous lenses pre-colonization to present, American Indian women writers in literature, decolonization in practice. So these are sexy titles. These are fun. These are exciting for students. They all fulfill GE requirements. And more importantly, I tell my students, and I have told my students this since I've been teaching and I'm in my 26th year of, uh, as a professor, when you take an American Indian Studies course, put it on your resume. I guarantee if nothing else, it will create conversation because you now have a unique set of skills and a knowledge base that almost no one else has right? Because we don't have that many programs. But what our programs in the past have failed to do was really focus on that intersection, preparing our students, what do you do with this degree? And so I have so many students that have come back to me telling me that they got a job that had nothing to do, for example, with a focus on uh, Native Americans, but because someone saw it on their resume, it opened up to a conversation where the students talked about their internship, their course, independent study, their exposure to this very diverse uh, community that is more than a racial group. We have sovereign status. So there, there's a discussion over the legal issues and statutes surrounding native populations, the you know, environmental regulations, for example, um, art history and culture, language preservation and politics. Um, uh, recently, our uh, local uh, CFOs and CBOs of some of our tribal government gaming operations here in Southern California held a meeting um, because they felt that students who are graduating from some of our um, regional universities with degrees in business and marketing and finance and accounting weren't doing well. They weren't staying. They, they weren't the best employees. And it wasn't that they didn't have skills in finance and marketing and accounting, but they didn't understand the unique history of the tribal governments that they were working with. So they asked me to come and meet with them and to figure out how can we better prepare these students who are graduating to come and work within these governments and these multi-billion dollar and multi-million dollar businesses and have a better understanding of the people and the narrative and the community and the language and the history and the religion and the philosophy. And so what I did was create a set of courses that were complementary to the students in business so that they can take those humanities courses to better leverage their business degree to work within tribal sovereigns, right? To have a long lasting career. And the success has been overwhelming, right? And the same can be said for the sciences. So we're creating, um, uh, an environment for students of all backgrounds to take humanities courses. And I really encourage students to double major. 
I really encourage students to double major and to engage in high impact practices. That is something we're really well versed in. In the last 10 years, um, our students have been very successful in passing uh, statewide legislation. One with the GIS project, where they use the visual, um, the, the visual technology of art mapping to address the issue of stereotypes and mascots. It was the first time ever in the country that an anti-Redskins legislation had been passed. Another one is the students used a, the visual um, media form of digital storytelling to document the impact of what it means to wear an eagle feather when you graduate. And so we were able to, to use that um, coupled with the California Indian Legal Services working with our then Alaska Native Assemblyman, Todd Gloria, who's now our mayor of San Diego, and the students created this video. And with that video, they were able to pass a piece of legislation where students now can adorn their regalia and wear an eagle feather. Um, so we're very excited about some of the impact that students are making in uh, community-based participatory action. So it's on the job training through the work that they're doing where they're giving back to community and they're making a real impact. When students make an impact in their humanities courses, they're like, what else can I do? Right, because that's real time investment and in seeing your knowledge base um, and the reciprocal relationship that it has with the community. And so um, because um, our focus in American Indian studies and our focus in the center is based on what we call the four R's, our core values, which are responsibility to support political and economic development, education, health and wellness, media and film, language preservation and natural resource management. So that's uh, responsibility. Two as reciprocity to reinforce collaborative research, fostering ind indigenous research methods through the humanities. Three, respect to champion sovereignty and cultural preservation. And four, relationship to create and sustain communication between tribes and scholars. We do have the good fortune to be located in a place where there's an abundance of tribes. We have more tribes in San Diego County than any other county in the United States. So our students have the unique opportunity to take a course. And sometimes that course is offered on tribal lands. So they're learning in real time, hands-on with the community. And the community also has the opportunity to come into the classroom. So sometimes students are meeting in a boardroom, a tribe's boardroom. Sometimes they're meeting in an after-school program where they're participating in language revitalization programs. And sometimes they're learning from the very lawyers that are protecting the sovereign status of tribes. So they're engaged um, in hands-on learning in community-based participatory research and they're making impact. They're placing it on their resume. Um, they're engaged in internships. And I don't think I've ever had an intern, uh, a student intern that wasn't asked to return or offered a paid position. And lastly, I would say, um, because I run a research center that works hand in hand with the American Indian Studies Department, I have the opportunity to pay students to engage in research. These aren't students that are paid to file. These aren't students that are, that are paid to sit at a front desk. These are students that have to lead and take on a research proje project that leaves the American Indian community better than how they found it working in collaboration with tribes. And they are paid um, 17 to $24 an hour. And when students are paid for the work that they're doing and they're doing work that matters and they're engaged in high impact practices, I would say you bet your bottom dollar they're heavily engaged in the humanities and they go on to earn graduate degrees in the humanities. Fantastic. Thank you, Jolie. And thanks to all three of you for these very uh, stimulating presentations. We've got a lot of great questions coming in, a lot of which have to do with the challenge of getting buy-in. Uh, and so can you talk a little bit about the strategies you found to be effective in getting your colleagues in the humanities to buy in to making a bigger commitment to supporting students' career development and getting your institution to invest in this work? I can add one of the things that I did, one, it was, um, was self-interest to grow the major. 
Um, since we have so many employers in the area who are interested in students who have an understanding of American Indian sovereignty and American Indian communities, I then created job fairs that were only for students who had taken American Indian studies courses. And I literally put a red velvet rope around the job fair. You can't come in unless you've taken these courses. And guess what? You can't take an internship in one of these very cool programs, unless you've taken these courses. And so you've, you've then made, it's a marketing ploy, right? You've made the humanities in these courses something unique and something that um, only those who have participated have access to these opportunities. I work in film and TV. I work in narrative change. The only way we're gonna really impact policy change is to remind people that we're human beings and that we're still here. So we have to affect a larger change. Students find um, the film and television in industry very interesting. So I said, you want to work in the industry? You have to learn how to write. You have to learn how to tell story you have to learn about the human experience. And so it's about marketing, you know, and I think if I think we have to um, remove ourselves from this old way of looking and thinking about the humanities. And how do we make the humanities um, something that people want, rather than a, a want to not a have to. And so that's something that I've done. I made it I've made it a little bit more attractive. And again, you know, looking at resume building and, and, and things of that nature, tell your students to put these classes on their CV and to find a special area because that is a unique set of skills. People are looking for students that can critically think and can work with diverse and dynamic communities and really read the room, right? It's um, algorithms can only do so much, but knowing how to interact and, and read the room is a skill that um, I think people are willing to invest in. Can I jump in on this discussion? I think it's a really important question. I feel like uh, getting faculty to move past their, their cynicism and their, and their frustration is a significant is a significant obstacle, um, and I and I say that as somebody that shares that that view and that um, and that attitude. But one of the things we did was um, we just challenged people to really think about how they were going to approach parents. We have this event called Make It Miami, where we try to recruit students. We're a, we're a seller university. We need students, right? So we're we're working to get them to come here. Um, and we have these events and we've had parents stand up and shout like, can you promise that my child will get a job, you know, and, and storm out when the answer was no, we can't. Um, but we, so we challenged uh, humanities faculty to come up with a an, kind of an elevator speech that was based on evidence that they could give to that parent and to take seriously, like, what are we doing? Can you really look them in the eye and say, in our department, in the French department or in the history department, we take this very seriously. And one of the things faculty are concerned about and one of the things that came out in our discussions in humanities works is this idea that our classes are just gonna be co-opted into this kind of neoliberal, you know, um, make better worker bees kind of class. And they're gonna, you know, we're gonna take like learning about the French revolution and convert that into writing, um, something practical that a corporation will want, right? So faculty are justifiably very concerned about that. And frankly, some of the career services people suggested things like that. They were like, that's what you should be doing. Um, what faculty, what everyone kind of agrees on is that the humanities has a, has a PR problem. Whatever solutions people might disagree about, everyone can see that. And so for me, getting faculty buy-in starts with that. How do we address the public relations challenge here? Whatever we might believe about our pedagogy and our value and our role, how do we, how do we go into a more a hostile world, very different from the one that we live in every day, and make that case in a brief, clear, persuasive way? Can I just add something really quickly? Um, why, why can't we celebrate alumni or former students, because I think that that would be the kind of lowest bar is like, 
let's celebrate their achievements, not only their graduation, but that, you know, at, at the University of Missouri, 92%, if not more, do have jobs like gainful employment or have chosen volunteer, um, full-time volunteer. So why don't we bring them back and have them vouch for our courses and the skills that they're learning? Because there's nothing more powerful than having a former student tell a current student in our, um, in our classes that this assignment was really useful out there in the world that when I had to, when I was thrown into my internship or when I was thrown into my job, I had to write a memo. And then I remembered what you had done, you know, in your class, you had had us do an assignment like a memo writing or that you had us give a presentation about um, a nonprofit spiel that you wanted us to right? So all these different ways that humanities are out there in the world, we are really celebrating our alumni and in that way, they're um, reinforcing the, um, you know, the odd reason why we chose these assignments or, you know, the odd um, teaching that we're using, but actually it's for a purpose. And that's the reinforcement, I think. Thank, thanks for all those responses. To kind of continue with this theme, but also kind of move into talking a little bit about on-campus partnerships as well. I wanted to field a question from Marianne Montgomery. She wrote, there's a challenge, I think, in balancing college level leadership with departmental initiative. If the college creates new roles, this can lead to even more reporting expectations for departments and faculty can get frustrated. But if departments have to build recruitment and career prep structures on their own, there's a lot of duplicative work and many of them will lose steam. I'd be interested in hearing from the panelists reflections and examples of how college leaders can help humanities departments to work together efficiently somewhat related to, and, and, and then, uh, yeah, so let's just take that, sorry. Can I, can I speak to that? Because that was one of the top priorities of Humanities Works. And one of the reasons the Dean, I, I, the Humanities Center paid nothing for this program over, we've paid, like maybe we paid, uh, we paid for the value in the Humanities Task Force. But after that, the Dean paid for it because one of the pitches I was able to make is we are going, all of our departments are running around like chickens with their heads, their collective heads cut off, trying to create marketing materials, writing to alumni, trying to have sessions for students. They all recognize the problem and they're all racing around trying to deal with it. And many departments had actually created their own career initiatives, but we have a career center that is well resourced, well funded, that has professionals that work there every day and actually do a great job of of running all of the things that we needed to do. So one of the things we really tried to do was to make sure that we were, first of all, sharing resources across departments. When we have an alumni speaker come in English, all of the humanities departments now are invited to that event. We should make sure those panels are all, they're reaching everyone. But also, let's use the Career Center. It's already funded in our university and we weren't, we weren't tapping into it because there was so much suspicion about it. Thanks. Leonard, Jolie, you wanna take up that question? I can also add a follow-up that, that might uh, prime the pump a little more of uh, the question of um, that given uh, that you're all housed in, uh, schools that have units other than humanities units, how do you get institutional support for your efforts over the interest of other units within your school? Lynn, you might approach that question of like, how do you make them work together since you're, you were serving not just the humanities folks? This is a tough, these are tough questions, um, mainly because my dean was the former dean uh, or former chair of English. And so as a result, quite a number of um, these kinds of faculty filled positions are coming from people that she knew in English, like myself, um, among other things. So having administrators obviously invested in humanities would be the easy answer, which I know is very difficult. Um, and in other uh, places that I've worked, for example, um, you know, I think to go back to the original question about duplicative work, I just threw up my hands and said, it is just going to happen. I mean, I think um, you know, there's different histories, there's different, um, you know, with each administration, there's a new way of doing things. And so, you know, 
in the absence of information, we were having departments create their own lists, like sort of crowdsourcing among faculty of who the alumni would be that they wanted, mainly because development at this time does not focus on zero to 10 out um, from graduation. So it's just an accepted duplicative, but if the benefit is enough that it will be, it's useful to have that information now, as opposed to wait for the university to kind of figure out who's in charge, that's one thing. Okay, so I've alighted the, the real issue in terms of the humanities. Um, I don't have a good answer. And I, I'm, I apologize for that, mainly um, in the sense that I feel that in every job that I've been at, um, I've had to advocate for the humanities and, um, and, and this, the, exactly as Tim, you were saying, right, the spiel of, of students, uh, of telling students' parents exactly what the humanities can do for their children, especially in women and gender studies, for example, which seems to be incredibly um, smushy as a um, possible, um, uh, you know, lucrative career, for, exa for example. So some of the things that my departments have done, right, is to um, have more of a um, social media presence to get more students involved with pushing out that information. And so that might mean, like in one of my feminist theory classes, is to learn about the institutional structure, about how um, women and gender studies classes are kind of thought of as an afterthought. Um, and, and to bring them into that conversation and really analyze why, and then develop um, social media content, because they're so much better at it than any of us would ever be, right? Develop that social media content on like why, and then have other students watch it and have the answer in their own words, in another colleague's words, as opposed to what we're trying to, you know, put out there in high balloon language or whatever. And so that's what we've done in women gender studies. For example, English is also doing that um, too, in terms of getting alumni to vouch for us and for what they've learned and how it's been useful in their careers. Jolie, I'm curious uh, what perspective you might offer as, as a chair of a interdisciplinary, not strictly humanities only department and uh, in the director of an interdisciplinary center that's been growing. Well, there's a, a couple of points that I want to build on um, between Lynn and, and Tim. I, I have to agree with Tim. It's There's a PR nightmare, right? Humanities. It's like almost like I wish we could do a name change or yeah. you know, colon something else, right? Um, but but I do think, and, I, and I'm looking at one of the questions about like majors in um, uh, psychology and communication. Right, you ask the student, what are you going to do with the psych degree? They have no answer for it, right? Or communication, because they understand what communicating means. But when you say humanities, they don't know. So we have we have to do a better job in really showing. And that's my emphasis on applied research that is across the board and bringing in other colleges. We are the largest college on our uh, campus, which is um, humanities, arts, and social behavioral sciences. Right. And so um, it's really been a, a survival for us to create courses that um, are interdisciplinary, that are not just, you know, create, of course, humanities is central to American Indian studies because of the tenets um, of sovereignty, history, culture, language, narrative, um, what have you. But we have to work in all of these other areas, right? Environmental protection, environmental science, um, biological. Um, uh, sciences, you know, business. And so making that really relevant helps us not necessarily be duplicative, but more kind of at the forefront and groundbreaking. And I think um, our institutions, just the very nature of academia with our colleges have kept us siloed, right? And said, this is what defines humanities. This is what defines social sciences. And it's really been um, interesting because for American Indian Studies, we've had to push hard up against your kind of mainstream humanities programs who really wanted to own turf. And it, it's kind of laughable to hear, a, you know, a literature department saying we own American Indian youth literature. And I said, really? <laughs> you know, and it's just like, we're not the enemy. Here's an opportunity for engagement, right? Same thing with history. His, history departments have really had a tendency to say, this is history and this is our way of doing history. We've decolonized history. So we're doing history through an indigenous lens, which is really invi inviting. So it's really kind of 
um, even breaking down with our humanities colleagues of take down the walls a little bit, allow for some of the intersections to happen and the relationship building to happen. And I think we can kind of move beyond these silos and create some real sustainable opportunities. Thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to flag before we, as we're running towards the end of our hour is there's been lots of really great questions. A lot of them are asking for details and more information about these wonderful initiatives that have been presented. Um, and so I'm happy to play the role. You know, feel free to email me uh, at smuir at nhalliance.org. I'm happy to connect with folks. You can reach out to these wonderful folks. Um, we'll, we'll try to get your, those specific questions answered after the session. Um, one broader question that I think is an excellent one that I wanted to take up um, with the time we have left is from Kathleen Cassidy. She writes, I'm a dean at a regional comprehensive that serves many first generation rural and BIPOC students. Recently, we went through retrenchment and I tried unsuccessfully to argue against laying off tenured humanities faculty. Some other administrators argued that since we serve so many students from underrepresented groups, we need to focus on useful majors that prepare students for careers. This was framed as a way of focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I actually find it condescending, classist, and racist to suggest that the humanities should only be available to those with privilege. I lost a battle, but I still intend to continue fighting this war. Do you have any resources or strategies to suggest for changing the conversation surrounding how we best serve students from underrepresented groups with a framework that values the humanities? Humanities serve real world problems. And if your classes and your faculty aren't creating a bridge to help your students solve critical real world problems, then you're missing the mark. And I, and I think there's a really great opportunity to not just talk about it, but to be engaged in, in you know, participatory research. So I would really encourage people to reshift their thinking um, and, and, and think about the humanities as a problem um, solver and a, it's a solution-based discipline to real world problems that are happening today in the communities that we live and, and work within. So I really, um, you know, this diversity, inclusion, justice initiative, those are words that really haven't done nothing for my community. And, and so I don't ask for to be included. I'm there and I'm present and our students are there and our research projects are present. And by being visible and um, having our students participate in a really engaged scholarship that win awards and that are visibly seen, that are on the local news, that are, you know, um, uh, their, their research projects are being held up by the governor or congressional leaders, then I have people engaging with us, but that's how you do diversity, inclusion, and justice. You just do it. So humanities solves real world problems. I like, I like that. Um, I, think, I think slogans are helpful, right? I think we need to be, we need to market this a little more directly. Take, like, take a page from the business playbook. So yeah, humanities is practical. When you ask employers what they want, they say, we want employees that can communicate clearly in writing and orally. We want them to have cultural competence or a sense of what it's like to be an other, to be someone other than yourself. Um, we want them to have an ethical bearing and a sense of perspective. And that is the wheelhouse of the humanities. That's what we do. We, we tend to have writing intensive uh, courses that focus on complex texts and require a great deal of perspective. And, you know, cutting that is, is foolhardy because that's what employers actually want. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and cultural competence are, the, are key right now to the humanities. And everyone is growing those programs while they are talking about cutting humanities departments and, and faculty members. It's completely illogical. So pushing back on that is really just a matter of helping administrators identify what real employers want. They want the things that we teach in the humanities. Um, and cutting those things is, is counterproductive. 
As a quick comment, what I find really fascinating is that humanities and really in the College of Arts and Sciences, right, most of their graduates go into three different industries during their career. So, and we send students into all of the industries. It's almost an equal kind of, mm -hmm. you know, a flow. So my former dean liked to call it the blue wave um, because it was in blue. And whereas other schools, professional schools, are just sending it to one, two, or three industries. And so what we're doing is developing a workforce that can shift and pivot and do all those things that we've had to, that have been the buzzwords of the pandemic. We are, we are teaching those students how to navigate a, a world and an economy that we actually are not prepared for and can't teach them about. So um, I think that that's what the humanities provides, and that is what um, what I'm trying, what I was trying to um, influence at my college. Right on, and I will just say also the the history of higher education I think is a really great resource here. It, you know, you can uh, dig up the stories of our past of you know when our folks tried to create completely different kinds of education for people of, you know, people of color, working class folks uh, of all colors, that, um, that that has been part of our history and that, um, you know, that there's a very, that, that, that there have been, it's been a pendulum swing and throughout our history, there have been forceful um, statements and persuasive statements made of why that is just completely wrong to do and that we need to offer the traditional liberal arts education that the founders thought were so important uh, to all of our citizens um, and make that available to everyone. So thanks so much for that question, Kathleen. Um, we are at the end of our hour here. Uh, so thank you very much for all attending. Thanks so much for the wonderful questions that have been asked. Uh, thanks so much to our three presenters and for the fantastic work you're each doing at your universities. Um, and again, want to help connect uh, folks and answer those specific questions about these great initiatives. Um, and we hope to see all of you um, at our next uh, event on June 22nd, where we'll talk about curricular innovations, which will definitely continue this career conversation as well. Thanks, everyone.